So we're in this series right now called Heart Shifts, and here's what it's about. It's all about the habits of the Christian life. These things that we do on a regular basis as Christians that get us closer to God, make us healthy believers, right? Like we grow as a result of these things. And we're calling it heart shifts. And the reason we're calling it heart shifts is because it's all about our relationship. And if we approach these things as religious people who are trying to check a box, they won't work. Can I get an amen? They won't work. Instead, we've got to approach it wanting Jesus, wanting friendship with God. And as we go with that motive, as we shift our heart into that place, wonderful things start to happen. So week one, we talked about letting God interrupt you and obeying his voice whenever he comes in and speaks to you. Second week, last week, Pastor Ricky talked about prayer and and even the Lord's prayer and how we come and we speak to God and we convert our stresses into prayer requests and we have a conversation with God as if he's our friend. And that's the spot where we talk to God. Today, it's about this. Today is letting God speak to us. Anybody know what this is? Come on, Bible. It's Bible, the word of God, all the Christian words for it, right? Um, You're going to need a Bible today. You folks online, you should hit pause right now and get your Bible. Uh, Get your Bible. If you're like, I don't have my Bible, Pastor, get your app. Let's load up the app. Um, The YouVersion app has got the Bible on it, but you're going to need it today. Also, we're going to need you to take notes today. And if you're like, I'm not a person who takes notes, you really need to take notes today. Amen? Amen. Absolutely. And if you're an older Christian who's, you're like, I've heard all this before and I know all this stuff, pastor. I don't need to take notes. You need to take notes more than anybody. (laughs) We all need to take them. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord God, we love you. And God, we want to learn, God, and I don't care how old we are, we've got more stuff that we can learn from you because you are infinite and we are not. So come and speak to us, infinite Lord. Show us some fresh things today, God. I pray that you would call us forward into a deeper place with Jesus in friendship. God, I pray that that's exactly how it would work and that we would be reminded of just how eternal your word is. God, we love you in Christ's name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Um, Say grass. Say flower. So the grass withers. The flower fades. But the word of God remains forever. I know we memorized it in different versions. The grass withers. And the flower fades but the word of the Lord remains forever. The grass withers, withers. Has your grass withered in Oklahoma? (laughs) Come on. Have you ever bought those flowers that looked so beautiful red when you bought them and they faded? Not so red after a few days, depending on whether you watered them or not, amen? Yes? The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Say it with me. The grass, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. You just memorized a Bible verse. Congratulations. But the word of the Lord remains forever. It's eternal. You can count on it. You can base your life on it. We're going to be talking about that today. So there's a member of our, our family, and I'm not going to name them because that would be mean as a you know, pastor's kids. It's a, it's a hard life. I don't know if you knew that. It's a hard life. So we don't name them up here if we can help it. But um, one of our family, I'll just leave it at that, um, came and approached Linda and I. Linda and I were on the couch. And we were watching a TV show. And it was one of these TV shows. And, and I don't know, 
19 seasons, I think this TV show had. You know what I'm talking about. You go and you're binging this monstrous thing, and, and you started eons ago. You don't even know when you started watching this show, right? And, and you've watched it all, and you know everything, all about the characters, and you're super, super invested. And all of a sudden, one member of our family that I will not name walks up and says, so what's going on? As if I'm going to pause the show and explain 19 seasons of story to them before we go any farther. Heck no. We're invested. If you want to know this story, you've got to invest. Go watch from episode one, and then you'll know. But it's so fun, isn't it? It's so fun to invest in those shows. Some of you are like, well, some of the shows are not so fun because they don't end well. And I totally get it. But the good ones, aren't they so good? Because you invest so much time and the origin stories and the characters, and you get so invested, and, and, and you care about these people and where they go. And then when the story actually sends them someplace and that big episode happens, it's so much joy that you get out of it. Why? Because you are a super fan at that point. You are a super fan. And we got super fans, not with just TV, but we got them in music also, yes? Like, you know those people who just listen to the greatest hits in the top 40 on the radio station? You're not like them. You know the deep cuts on that artist, right? Like, you know all their albums and when they came up and you know their backstory and you know all of this stuff. Why? Because you are a super fan and because you are a super fan, you get all the joy from it and it is this rich musical experience for you. And you sports people who I do not understand at all. <laughs> I watch the Super Bowl and enjoy the commercials. <laughs> but you sports people, you're this way. You're super fans. Like, you're all into it. It's not just a game to you. Like, you know all the players by name, right? Like, by their number, you know all their stats. You know their backstory. You know what this game actually means for the season. You know how pivotal it is. You've been tracking this coach for a long time. You know the whole adventure that is their season, I guess. And you love it. And I love that you love it. But you've invested so much time into it. And I want you to see the fact that all these things are complex. And you invest so much of yourselves in it. And because you've invested, you get all the joy out of it. And sometimes we come to the Bible. And we say, God, I wish it was just like a, a spiritual Google search bar. And I could just type my question in. And I could just quickly get a very simple spiritual answer back from the Google search bar. And he didn't give us a spiritual Google search bar. He gave us a book. He gave us an ancient book. It's actually 66 books written by 40 different authors across 1,500 years this ancient book was handed down to us down through the centuries. The word of God breathed out by him every single word. And we're going to be talking about that. But he gave us a book, not a search bar, because he wants us to invest. Can I just say that? If you invest, it's a richer experience for you. The fact that it's a book is not just because it's old. It's by design. He wanted it that way. Because he wants you to binge it all, super fans. That's what he wants from you. Because he knows that richness and joy are at the end of it. And sometimes we want shortcuts with God. But as long as you want a shortcut with God, your friendship is going to stay shallow. And it's not what he wants for you. He doesn't want a shallow friendship with you. He wants a rich friendship with you. And he wants joy with you. And so he's called you to be a super fan this morning. That's what he wants. Now, who am I speaking to this morning? I'm speaking to people who are saved this morning. I'm speaking directly to people today who are hungry for God and you've surrendered your lives to him and you want something with God. I'm speaking to you today. The reason I'm speaking to you is because, because you have a hunger that you've began with. And he is your Lord. He is your Savior. And I'm telling you, this is how you have a friendship with him, not just a religion. Because religion is dead, and religion's done nothing for you. Can I get a better amen this morning? Amen. You want a friendship with Jesus, with the real king of the universe. 
the real king eternal. Do you know who I'm talking about when I say the king eternal? I, I saw a moth the other day and it was on my front porch and it was the most beautiful moth I had ever seen. Super simple. It was all white wings and it had all these little black triangles in different shapes all over its wings. It looked like a monochromatic stained glass window on a moth. Do you know God designed and formed that moth? We've been lied to and, and told to believe that all the diversity and, the, and the, the, the creativity that we see in the world is the result of random chaos. And it's not. It's not. There's a creative and powerful God who designed all the variety that you see today because he wanted that variety to exist. And he actually has taste. Amen. Amen. He has taste and he has power. And can I tell you a little bit more about his power? Do you know he's the one who created the stars and the suns and the supernovas and the black holes and all the galaxies and placed them exactly where he wanted them to be. He's the one who fine-tuned this universe. Scientists think that they've got the laws of physics. All they did was discover the laws of physics that were already there. They didn't make up anything. They simply measured and discovered what the, the great designer of the universe had built into the universe, the order that he had made there. Why does a mama kangaroo carry around her baby in her pouch? Because God said so. Because God designed it to be so. And that's the way that he is. Why is it that when uh, opera singers sing the, the high C uh, for, uh, you know, at, at a certain uh, volume and, and long enough, it shatters glass? Because he decided that it would be so. Why are there primary colors and why is there a color wheel and why is there color theory that help artists know if you follow these principles exactly, you will create something that's visually pleasing. Because as they plumbed the depths of their craft, they found that there was order already there in the universe. Why did the ancient mathematicians in ancient Babylon and ancient Egypt, why did they keep running into the mathematical constant pi over and over and over again? And some of you know what I'm talking about. They didn't make it up. They ran into it. They discovered it. It was already there. Because the Lord of all the universe built his universe with order at its center in every single way that you can possibly imagine. And the same God who is so indescribable and beyond us, he is infinite, came to earth for 33 years and walked in our shoes. And how did he do that? I have no idea. But he did. And he loved us. And he died for us. And not, is he, not only is he so amazing, but he is so personal. Because he's chosen to be. And this infinite God cannot be shallowly described in a 30-second YouTube video or TikTok. You cannot sum him up. God is unsum upable. He is unsum upable. He is the infinite king. So don't run from his depth and his complexity. Run toward it. <laughs> Do you see? He has made himself deep for you to go and throw yourself into the depths of him because he is infinite. And we are a creature, creatures who are made to desire and love and worship an infinite God. And so many of our problems in this world are the fact that we keep chasing after finite things in this world and they do not satisfy us. And we find the end of them over and over and over again. And you've chased your career and you found the end of it. Yes. And you've chased drugs and you found the end of it. And you need a bigger and bigger hit every single time. Why? Because whenever a human being finds its desire, it just wants more. It's the way we're designed. We're designed only to connect to an infinite God and it suddenly works. And we've chased all the wrong things. He is infinite and unsum upable. And he's invited you in. That's the exciting part. He's not left you out. He's not shut the door. And he's not stayed silent in the universe. He wrote a book to draw you in so that you could know who he was. I love that. Do you have your Bibles today? 
get a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, get a Bible. If you don't have a Bible with you today, this is, this is a no guilt zone, amen? No guilt zone in this church. We're a grace church. So pull out your YouVersion app and follow along with us and take good notes because you need notes. You need a Bible. It's a huge part of us walking with Jesus Christ is to read a Bible and to read the word of God. And I just want to admit to you that if you just do what they told me when I was a teenager and they said, oh, just take a Bible and just open it up at random. Don't do that. It's bad. Because you'll open to the worst part. You'll like land in Leviticus and they're talking about what to do with mold in a house or something like that. And you're like, how does this apply to my life? I have no idea. Or it'll be like the genealogies, right? This person begat this person, begat this person. It's like reading a phone book and you're like, I can't pronounce it and I don't want to pronounce it. It's awful. And I get it and I totally agree. Start in the book of John. John chapter one. Start in Matthew, Matthew chapter one. Start in one of those books. You might start in Proverbs. I would recommend John or Matthew. They're gospels, which means they're the description of the life of Jesus Christ. If there's a place to start, it's know deeply the life of Jesus and know deeply his words. And, and, and once you've gone there and you've read through the book of Matthew, start again and read it again. And then after the second time, read it a third time. Read it over and over and over we get weird in the church. We sometimes think that, I don't know, it's like a competition or a race or a qualification or something. Like I somehow need to read the whole Bible in a year. People walk around saying, I read the whole Bible in a year. Aren't I awesome? Somebody give me a gold star. It's great. And if you read the whole Bible in a year, it's great. But be careful of your words because we're saying to brand new Christians sometimes that this is the only pace that God is pleased with. That's not true. It's a quiet room now. It's not about getting a mass of scripture into your brain. It's about meeting with Jesus. That's what it's about. That's what this whole series is about. Let's get back to basics and let's find out what this is really all about. Because you might have all the scripture up here. And if you don't know God here, know him. It's not changing you then. And that's what it's about. We're going to get to that verse in a little while. But read and don't get intimidated. And it's going to intimidate you in the beginning. And we've all experienced that. We read the first few days and we're like, this is hard. It's hard. Especially if you're not a big reader outside of the scripture. It's definitely going to be hard when you're reading the scripture. But it's going to get easier. It's not your education that you bring as a Christian to the word of God. It is your stubbornness. Can I get an Amen. Bring your stubbornness to God's word and do not give up and keep reading no matter what and get yourself a Bible, get yourself an app. I don't care. The apps are really, really nice, especially if you're starting out. You're like, I can listen to the Bible read to me in the car. Don't we live in a glorious generation <laughs> that that's possible? I just love that. It's wonderful that that is there for us. Also, get yourself a community around you. It's huge. Go to a life group where those people are also reading the scripture so that you can keep each other strong. The very first year that I was walking with Jesus Christ, I had been convicted at a conference that I needed to have a quiet time, time with God in prayer, in the word every single day. And there was a friend from that conference and we made an agreement to call each other every single night, every night without fail. And we did for a year. And all we asked each other was, did you meet with God today? Did you have your time? And if you didn't, but I'm tired, do it anyway. But I'm tired, do it anyway. Who knows? He might surprise you even in your tiredness. And you might hear something anyway. No big deal. We have a gracious God. He's not measuring your performance when you meet with him. He's just not doing that. He just loves you and he loves that you showed up. How many of you are thankful that he loves that you showed up? Oh, that's the kind of God we serve. Keep going. Get other like-minded people around you who are also trying to walk with Jesus and let them hold you accountable. Now take out your Bibles and we're going to go to 2 Timothy 3.16. And again, you should be taking notes by now. Have I mentioned notes yet? Okay. 2 Timothy 3.16. The first thing it's going to tell us is that the Bible is true for everything in your life. 
All scripture is God breathed, it says, and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. 66 books written across 1,500 years by 40 different authors in multiple countries and cultures. And God breathed every single word onto the page. And we believe that by faith. And the scripture tells us that. And not only do we believe by faith that it was breathed out by God, but we believe that it was protected down through the centuries to get the scripture to us. And some people will tell you online that, man, it's a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. And you can't really trust it because some of its words got lost along the way. It's absolutely wrong. They actually have manuscripts that are super early to the originals within the same generation. They exist in museums. We go back to those original texts. Modern translations are made often through those original texts. It's not a copy of a copy of a copy. Don't let the lies be told to you. It still does require faith though. It absolutely requires faith. Next verse, Psalm 1.1. The Bible brings health into your life. I love this. It's King David writing this very first Psalm in the book of Psalms. He says, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers. Do you see what he's doing there? He's saying, this is a way of life. Don't enter into that way of life. Instead, he says, but we delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. The man of God is like a tree planted in the riverbank along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither and they prosper in all that they do. Notice how he talks about meditating on the scripture day and night. It's interesting. Why King David? Are you talking about meditating on the scripture day and night? It's, it's a thought process. Like you're getting it stuck in your head and you're never letting go of it. And like, why are you doing it that way? If you go back and you study at that time in those ancient times, they did not actually have physical Bibles that they carried around. There was no printing press. There certainly wasn't any smartphone apps, right? And so what they had was the local synagogue would have had some of the scrolls of God's word. And they would have gone to worship, likely on a Saturday, because that was the Jewish Sabbath. And at church, some of the stuff out of the scrolls would have been read to them, explained. And what David is saying here is what was given to me I meditate on it day and night, all week long. But wait a second, David. Don't you, don't you need a sermon? And then you also need a Sunday school lesson. And then you also need a different devotional lesson every single day. And then when you're in the car, don't you listen to sermons from preachers giving you different lessons also? And then aren't you throughout the day listening to other things online, like on YouTube and stuff like that, and reading additional books and doing additional Bible study? And by the end of a given week, a modern Christian has tried to digest, what, 30, 35 different Bible lessons? How many of those are you able to actually integrate into your life and obey? Very few. Uh, Pastor Rick Warren calls this spiritual gluttony. We're in, in, in American culture, we're so convinced that we please God by bringing so much Bible content into our lives, but we don't actually follow any of it because we can't. You can't process it all. So David is saying, hey, I'm, I'm reading the Bible by meditating on it all day long. And it just never leaves my heart. Like, God, what'd you mean? I, I knew some guys in college and they had these old Casio watches. Have you ever seen the old Casio watches? And they would set this little alarm on their watch because they were super Christians. They would do this. They would set it for every single hour. It would go off. This little alarm would sound every single hour. And what they would do is when the alarm went off, they would stop and they would say, God, remind me of what I read this morning. Take me back there. Is there something new that you want me to see? understand. And they would meditate for a moment. So do you see how they were slowing down the content, but they were increasing the meditation? Because it's about God speak. God speak to me. Next verse, the Bible guides your decisions and steps. 119.105, your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. 
He's not saying that it's a Google search bar here. What he's saying is that as you let the word of God come into your life every single day, it changes you. It shapes you. It forms you into a different kind of person than you were before. Because again, you're investing, you're super fanning that thing, right? And like so much of that content gets in you that God speaks to you and changes you as you go. So for instance, in in the book of Proverbs, it talks a lot about debt. And some of you guys have read the book of Proverbs. And it talks about debt and it really gives you a, a very 3D view of what debt does to your life. And it says, if somebody gets into debt, they become a slave to the person who lent the money to them. And some of you guys have been in deep debt before. You're like, yeah, actually, that sounds really familiar. It's, it's kind of like a slavery relationship. It really is. And so the Bible gives that concept, right? Like that gets into you. And then when the credit card company sends you that wonderful new offer of a credit card, do you see how the word becomes a lamp to my feet and a light to my path? And it says, hey, how about maybe not? But it's not because I dealt with it like Google. It's because I've let the word of God come in and change me, alter my views, so I'm ready for those decisions when they come. Next, the Bible gives our life a foundation, Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. This is Jesus talking. And he says, it's not just about hearing God's words. It's about obeying God's words. That's that spiritual gluttony again. You've actually got to process the calories that you take in. You've actually got to integrate it into your life. Jesus says you can't just hear it and become more knowledgeable about God. You have to live it. Walk with God. And then it's a foundation for your life. Is this starting to come into view? This is Jesus talking. He's like, and when you do this, it's like you've got this solid rock foundation that you can build a house on. And the house is going to be good because the foundation is good. Sometimes people come and they'll ask me, how do we have a Christian family? Like we've got a family and we're Christians, but how do we have an actual Christian family pastor? And this is one of the things that I'll talk to them about is have a Bible at the house. And it's not just about the magical object, right? Like we're not being weird like that. It's it's have a Bible in the house and bring the Bible out when you're facing crisis or you're facing the big decisions. And over the years, The practice becomes whenever we don't know what the answer is because culture has hit us with something challenging or we're not sure where to move or we're not sure what to do with this money. All the things that a family faces across the course of the years. We say, what does God's word say? And in front of the kids, we bring it out and we say, what does God's word say? And again, it might not be a physical Bible. It might be you guys standing in the kitchen and saying, the reason we're doing X, guys, is because the Bible says this, and we are a Christian family, and so we go to God's word as our standard. And then the kids see that practice over and over and over again, and when they become older and they hit a crisis, what are they inclined to do? The Bible is our standard. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Yes. Next, Joshua 1, 8. The Bible should fill your minds every day. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it. There's meditate again, day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. And I, and I love how he says you'll be successful. I don't think he's talking about money here. Don't think he's talking about money. I'm not anti-money, by the way. That's not the point. But I think it's much, much bigger than this. Most people, when you hear accounts of someone who was on their deathbed and they were looking back at their life, they seldom say, I wish I would have made more money. But you might hear regrets like, I wish I would have been a better father. You might hear regrets like, I wish I would have been a better leader, a better spouse. I wish I would have invested in better things. When you build your life on God's word, you will be prosperous and successful because he will shape you into the image of Jesus Christ. And you'll have fewer regrets on that deathbed. Amen? Amen. Amen. Next, Hebrews 4.12. I love this one. The Bible penetrates your soul and tells you the truth. For the word of God is living and what? Active. Active. 
it's alive. It's alive. You sit down with the Bible, it's alive. What does that mean? It means the Holy Spirit's in it, speaking to you through it. It's not dead words on a page. The Bible is alive. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to divide your soul and spirit, your joints and your marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of your heart. It is an x-ray device to the human soul. And some of you are smiling right now because you sat in a room with the Bible before and it started to talk to you about you. And you're like, oh, dang. I just sat down for a little encouragement today, Jesus. I just want a little pat on the back, a little devotional. Why'd you have to go and say that to me? Right? Because it's living and active and it's a risky thing to step in the room with a double-edged sword. Amen? And that's what it is. And it's a good thing that it's that way. Next, the Bible shows us Jesus. John 5, 39. You study the scriptures diligently. This is Jesus talking because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. This is a conversation. If we keep this up for a second. This is a conversation between Jesus Christ and a group of Pharisees and scribes. And he says, you're searching the scriptures. And by the way, you're experts on the scriptures but you've missed the big point. You've read it, you've studied it, you know all the verses, you could go on the Bible quiz shows and you would win every single time. You're awesome, we all agree that you're awesome. But it's been about control for you and it's been, been about ego and pride for you. It's not been for the right reasons. He said, so what you've missed is that they speak about me. They've been a doorway to me all along, Jesus says. He says, in them you think you have eternal life. You don't have eternal life in the Bible. Let that sit for a second. Come on, people of God. We don't get saved from the Bible. The Bible isn't your salvation. You could be a seminary professor, wonderfully trained, and not saved. It's not the Bible that saves you. I don't believe in the power of the Bible. I don't. I believe in the power of God. Amen. And the Bible is a window to see God, to see Jesus, to understand him. People say weird things to me sometimes, like I believe in the power of prayer. I don't. I believe in God and his power. And prayer is the way I talk to him. And there's a difference. Prayer is not some scientific, magical language that if we form the phrases in the right way, it forces God's hand to do magical stuff for us. I don't believe in the power of prayer in that way. I believe prayer is a wonderful tool, an open door that God gives us to talk to our Father. I believe in his power. And these words matter. Jesus is saying there to the Pharisees, you got tweaked just a little bit. You thought eternal life was in the Bible itself. It's not. It's a window to seeing Jesus. He's the only one with eternal life for you. Amen? It's challenging stuff today. Challenging stuff. I open up the scripture and I see Jesus. I open up the scripture and it's my lens. I ask Jesus to speak to me through it. I ask God to show me what he's actually like through the words. Because what is the scripture from Genesis to Revelation? It is the story of God interacting with mankind, reaching out to rescue mankind. Well, God, how did you do that? And how do you, how do you work, God? What's your personality like, God? You learn it by peering into the scripture. Read Matthew. Read John. Learn what Jesus is actually like. Don't go deep into Star Wars. I love Star Wars. Watch the movies. Enjoy the movies. But don't go too deep. Why? Because you go too deep into that stuff and all of a sudden it's, it's like Jar Jar Come on. <laughs> and it's like stuff about the force. You're like, George Lucas, you are great at special effects, dude. 
But when it comes to religious philosophy, uh uh-uh. It's kind of goofy, kind of dumb. Yes? So enjoy it, but don't go too deep. It's the same with your sports, by the way. Like, enjoy the games, but your sports heroes and sports gods, I mean, they're great and all, but you look too close for too long, you're going to see a whole lot of humanity there, and you're going to be really disappointed in your heroes. And it only takes a little while, right? Because we're all human, and you've had that experience. So it's like, sure, go deep, but don't go too deep. Because you're going to get disappointed. It's the nature of everything in this world. Everything is about cotton candy depth to it in this world. The only thing that you can give yourself wholly to is Jesus Christ. And he'll never disappoint you. You can keep studying him. You can keep peering in. You can keep trying to, trying to figure him out. And he's all there. You'll never be disappointed. The depth is there. And he'll never let you down. That's my testimony to you. Like I can teach you technically things that are true, but at this point, I'm giving you my testimony here. I've walked with God and I've found him to be real. And the more I've walked with God, the more precious that time has been for me. To know God is different than to know about God. There's a lot of people you know about, but who do you know? And do you know Jesus? Do you know him for real? Look at this word he says, John 17, 3. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one that you have sent. Stop looking for God to be a fix. Stop looking for God to be a pill. Pastor Ricky said it last week. Stop looking for God to be some kind of vending machine that vends blessings out to you. He's so much bigger than that. It's not that he's not capable. He's just so much. He's the infinite God. And he's invited you into the dance. He's invited you to know him. And he wants a friendship with you. He wants you to know him for real. Do you know him for real? Like, like I know Linda. I don't know just about Linda, my wife. I know her. Do you know what the difference is? Like, I know her personality. I don't just know facts. I know what she's like. I know, I know how she reacts to things. I can predict her moves. There's sometimes people will come to me and they will say something like, you know, I think God is this way and I'll say no. Why? Because that's not what he would do. Because I know him. I know Linda. I can predict her moves. I can predict her reactions most of the time. Not always. <laughs> It was close. It was super close. <laughs> you know, it's just, it was just something about, you know, we'll, we'll be 26 years married this year. Woo! November, November. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> it's a lot of Christmases. <laughs> you know, it's a lot of hard times. And we know each other. We can predict each other, and we trust each other. And that's what builds in every single one of those reactions. Every time, every time you go in to a crisis, and then you come back out the other side, we, we had this crisis. I've told this story here before, but, it's, but our romance was between the two of us was just shattered. There was hardly any love there at all. And, and if we were going to divorce, it was going to be in that season, okay? I'm just being real with you. And a lot of people helped us, and we sought God, and and we came back together again, and the Lord brought healing to us, and it took time, okay? It took time. Sometimes people come in, and they're like, yeah, we've shattered our marriage across the last six years. We'd like you to fix it in six minutes, please. Um, No. Takes time. And it's like, and the Lord did that, and praise to God. But also you come out at at the other side of that healing. You're looking each other in the eye and it's like, you didn't give up on me. You could have run and you didn't run. And if we could get through that, we can get through a lot of things. And now we know some things about each other. And we know some things about how deep this love actually goes for us. Right? And we know it in a way that nobody could have ever told us before. It's not information. It's knowledge. And so when Jesus Christ says, 
hey, eternal life can start now for you. And what eternal life is, is that you could know God. You could know him at that level that goes beyond facts. You could walk with him and you could walk with him just so much and get to know Jesus so much that you can predict him and you can trust him and you can have intimacy with him. And I want you to have that because guys, that is eternal life now. Like you read about Abraham, you read about King David, you read about uh, Adam walking with God in the cool of the day, you should be jealous. Ah, come on, Christians. You should be jealous. We're not here to just do church. We're here to know God. And they knew God. And when you read that, is it boring to you? Or you're like, oh God, how do I get there? How do I know you? Like they knew you. Why, why, why is it only them? Why can't I have that? We ought to want it. So I'm going to have an opportunity for you right now. And we're going to read to you a scripture. And I want you to have it in front of you. So we're not going to put it up on the screens. So if you would take out your Bible right now, and it's going to be Psalm 46. <clears throat> and if you're a smartphone person, we're putting a QR code up on the screen. Even you online folks, we're putting a QR code available to you as well. And if you click that QR code, and for those older folks like me who are trying to figure this out, you open up your camera app and you point it at the QR code and it ought to pop up with a link in theory, depending on your phone and take you right to it. And it's going to be Psalm 46, right in the version that we're going to be reading. And we're going to read it to you. But I want this moment to be special. I don't want it to be, we're just reading it like we normally do in church. I want you to, I want you to listen and ask God to speak to you. As we read this passage, I want you to be praying in your mind, Jesus, would you speak something to me? Only to me. That's for me. Show me something about you. Make sense? I picked Psalm 46 because this last week, Hurricane Ian hit Florida. And my daughter, Davy was in art college in Savannah, Georgia. And the path was looking like it was headed toward Savannah, at least maybe. And some of you guys have been following that closely. You know, at this point, they're telling us that 40 or so people have died um, in Florida and Cuba maybe. And they're saying that that number is probably going to go up. And it's... It's tragic to read that and to hear about it. It's very, very different when your daughter is in its path. Can I get an amen? amen? And so there was about a day there, and we did not know exactly where this was going and how it was going to end up. And Davy was able to get to a friend's house and, and be okay, and, and uh, she stayed there out of the path. And everything kind of blew over, and it was fine. But again, you know what it's like to not know if it's going to be fine. And so God took me to this passage in Psalm 46, and there were some things here that were precious and spoke to me. I just want to know what speaks to you today. I want you to have your moment. So Carrie is going to come forward right now, and she's going to read Psalm 46 to us. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. He, God of Jacob, is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. 
He says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Okay, so let's just take a beat and let's slow it down and let's have some silence here. What did God say to you? What did Jesus reveal to you about yourself, about him? If you need to glance back down at it, feel free to. Part of it jumped out at you. He gave you that phrase for a reason. Talked to a lot of folks after first service, and like, this is what I got, this is what I got. And that was to you specifically. And what are you supposed to do with that? And how are you going to walk in that? And the most exciting thing is that the infinite God of the universe spoke to you, and he had something just for you today. That's what's exciting about that, amen? Why don't you guys stand? He loves you and he has not abandoned you. The reason he spoke to you today is because he has invited you into the dance. He wants you to have friendship with him. It's a miracle to hear God speak. I pray that you would become addicted to it. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you, God, for the way that you reach out to us. Lord, I thank you that you have the power, the love, the intellect, God, to reach to every single person in this room today, every single person online. God, you have have the ability, Lord, to see us, to see our needs. Lord, I pray that your word would be powerful in our lives, that we would walk in and change. I pray, God, for a new habit. I pray that we would start to go after your word. Thank you, Lord, for not giving up on us. We love you. In Christ's name, amen.